53η Biennale της Βενετίας. Είμαστε εδώ για να σας παρουσιάσουμε σε δύο συνεχόμενες εκπομπές όλα όσα συμβαίνουν. Και βέβαια όλα όσα συμβαίνουν είναι υπερβολή, γιατί συμβαίνουν τόσο πολλά που είναι αδύνατον κανείς να τα παρακολουθήσει μέσα σε τόσο λίγο χρονικό διάστημα. Παρ' όλα αυτά νομίζω ότι έχουμε καταφέρει να σας δώσουμε την γενική αίσθηση και μερικά από τα πολύ πολύ σημαντικά πράγματα που είδαμε εδώ στη Βενετία. Λοιπόν, τι θα δούμε. Θα δούμε βεβαίω την ελληνική συμμετοχή, την τιμητική συμμετοχή για την Ελλάδα, που είναι η πρόσκληση του Λουκά Σαμαρά. Μία πρόσκληση η οποία οπωσδήποτε έχει την αξία τη και βέβαια με πάρα πολλέ ε, εντυπώσει γύρω από το πώ είναι στη μένη αυτή η έκθεση, αν ήταν η κατάλληλη στιγμή να συμβεί αυτή η πρόσκληση και άλλα πράγματα που θα τα δούμε στη διάρκεια. Θα μα μιλήσει ο επιμελητή, ο Αμερικανό επιμελητή του Λουκά Σαμαρά, ο κ. Χίξ. Θα δούμε βεβαίω και την Κυπριακή συμμετοχή με τον Σοκράτη Σοκράτου. Θα δούμε ορισμένα από τα εθνικά περίπτερα που συμμετέχουν στα Giardini, αλλά ακόμα πιο σημαντικό από τις εικόνες που θα δούμε είναι η ερμηνεία που δίνει ο διευθυντής της φετινής Biennale, κύριος Birnbaum, ο οποίος φυσικά και μας έχει μιλήσει για τον τίτλο και την ιδέα της φετινής Biennale που είναι Making Worlds, φτιάχνοντας κόσμους. What does it mean to make? Is it a creation, divine inspiration, or is it a craft, uh, question of craftsmanship, or is it an architectural, technical issue, you know? Um, But in all the languages, it's about creating new things and not just objects, but, you know, objects that bear significance, meaning it's maybe a language or an uh, environment, uh, a whole world. And it doesn't only mean that it has to be huge cosmological uh, uh, installations. It can be tiny things. A piece of writing on a piece of paper can make us look at the world differently. Ο τίτλος της έκθεσης έδωσε τη δυνατότητα φαίνεται στους καλλιτέχνες να ελευθερώσουν δυνάμεις και αυτό έχει πραγματικά πολύ καλά αποτελέσματα. Μέσα σε αυτές τις δυνάμεις που ελευθερώθηκαν έχουμε και μια έκπληξη και είναι η συμμετοχή της Γιούλιας Χατζηγεωργίου, μιας καλλιτέχνηδας η οποία έχει φτιάξει το περιβάλλον μέσα στο οποίο για τις μέρες, τις τρεις-τέσσερις πρώτες που, διαρκεί, που διαρκούν τα εγγένεια της Biennale, ε, απαγγελόταν ποιήση. Ποιήση σε γλώσσες ανάμεσα τους η ρωσική και η ελληνική, ανάμεσα στους απαγγέλλοντες και ο Μπέρνμπαου, ο διευθυντής της Biennale. Θα το δούμε και αυτό. Ε, το κόνσεπτ αυτό είχε να κάνει με το Μόσκο Poetry Club, που το είχαμε δει στη Θεσσαλονίκη τον περασμένο χρόνο. Σας τα λέω όλα αυτά γιατί έχει μια σημασία το πώς συνδέονται κάποιοι καλλιτέχνες και κάποια γεγονότα με πράγματα που ήδη εμεί έχουμε παρακολουθήσει σε διάφορες άλλες περιπτώσεις. Λοιπόν, ας ξεκινήσουμε να τα βλέπουμε μαζί. Μείνετε μαζί μας αυτή την ώρα, όπως και την επόμενη εβδομάδα, άλλη μια ώρα. Δύο εκπομπές αφιερωμένες στην πιενάλη της Βενετίας και νομίζω αρκετά πλούσιες και νομίζω ότι θα σας αρέσουν πολύ. Ελάτε μαζί μου. Πηγαίνουμε για τα Giardini για να ξεκινήσουμε να σας δείχνουμε τις εθνικές συμμετοχές, μετά τα Arsenale και ό,τι καλό και ωραίο βρούμε τώρα όμως και πηγαίνοντας για τα Giardini. Συναντήσαμε αυτό το έργο που βλέπετε πίσω μου και που είναι η δουλειά μιας ομάδας καλλιτεχνών που βρίσκονται στο Άμστερνταμ, ζουν και εργάζονται εκεί και έχουν φτιάξει μια πλατφόρμα για τα media και για την τέχνη μέσω mail, internet, έναν κυβερνοχώρο ουσιαστικά που μας είναι αρκετά γνώριμος τα τελευταία χρόνια στο βαθμό που ενδιαφέρει κάποιους οικαστικούς καλλιτέχνες. Όμως, εδώ τα πράγματα είναι λίγο πιο σύνθετα. Η εγκατάσταση αυτή έχει στηθεί σε αυτό το σημείο λίγο πριν τα Giardini για να καταγράφει τους περαστικούς, επώνυμους και ανώνυμους, που πηγαίνουν να επισκεφθούν την 53η Μιενάλη της Βενετίας. Αλλά θα μάθουμε τώρα περισσότερα για αυτόν τον οργανισμό, για αυτή την πλατφόρμα των media και για το ρόλο που παίζει στην διεθνή καστική σκηνή από έναν καλλιτέχνη και τον υπεύθυνο αυτή τη ομάδα. Είναι ο Ρενέκ, είναι δίπλα μου. Ξεκινάω αμέσω να σα παρουσιάζω την 53η Biennale τη Βενετία με αυτό το παράδοξο και νομίζω ενδιαφέροντα τρόπο. Well, Ρενέκ, hello. Hello. This is a surprise. It's the first time we meet something like this in our promenade Giardini. Okay. So, uh, there is a platform for media art and the culture that broadcast digital and interactive artworks. What it is about? Uh, you, are, you are established in Amsterdam, Holland? Yes. So tell us the story. What we, uh, what we wanted to do is in, in, in 
instead of what uh, all the national participations do is uh, they the, the, most of the time the state is uh, giving an assignment to a curator and a curator gives an assignment to an artist mm -hmm. and we want to show in the context of new media uh, uh, another another way to show art mm -hmm. we want to show it on the streets uh -huh. so outside of the classical context in the context of the the, the, of the urban context and uh, what we did we uh, invented last year this platform uh, 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 it's a platform for digital art interactive art and what we call e-culture and uh, basically what we do is we give assignments to artists designers interaction designers to make interactive artworks uh, which means that the public on the street can actively participate into the to the end result of, of the artwork. Mm -hmm. But what kind of art do you show? Here we have example, okay. But is this what you are doing or there are different options? What we want to show is really interactive. So people are part of the artwork. Uh -huh. So instead of just looking at it, like inactive, we want people to participate interactive. And, and really form a part of the artwork. So where do you work? Do you have a studio or do you work through internet? How do you work? We work in Amsterdam from the studio, but uh, this pavilion is traveling from city oh, to city, and really? which is the center of our network. Mm -hmm. And what we do is we broadcast these artworks, not only on the big screen in the pavilion where we are, but also on a network of what we call Drop Stuff Hotspots, mm -hmm. which are kind of media, media boxes, and mm -hmm. we put them in museums, libraries, okay public transport stations. So there is an address that we can enter in the, in, uh, the internet and find yeah. details on this, okay? Yeah. So, uh, so yep. uh, you, you, we also broadcast this live on the internet mm -hmm. and also people from home can participate into, into the artworks. Okay. They, so if you make a Dropstuff account, you're even able to send us your own creative uh -huh. work and our uh, staff will uh, look uh -huh. whether we can broadcast it. Um, did Mr. Birnbaum invite you to the biennial or you, you came by yourselves? I mean, you decided to install uh, during this period. Yeah, both. Uh, first, we came up with the idea. Okay. And then uh -huh. uh, Mr. Birnbaum had to approve it himself. And, uh -huh. he, and he, he luckily he did. And, and finally, he liked it very much, I think. He yeah? liked it very much, I think. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It, it, it's very it, spectacular. It's, and it's a very good entrance to the biennial. A very good idea. Thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, you told me there is an artist here, but uh, he created this part of yeah, the work we he see has, behind. He created this specific artwork that we're broadcasting right now. Okay, Ca can he tell us a few words about the idea of this crazy car here? Yeah, of course. <laughs> okay, can yeah. you call him? Yeah. Um, I think it's because um, uh, when I was young, I always went to uh, I went to parties, and um, I find uh, only a party with only a DJ is very boring. And I liked uh, humor and I liked uh, art, so uh, I was wondering why why can't I combine humor, art, and sound? For, uh, the, I, w I want to combine art into the the, 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 the late evenings where people enjoy and as yeah, also you're, um, you're right. This is like a toy. I mean, it I is remember. a toy. It's a yeah. big boy's toy. Or can we move it? Yes. On the, on the megaphone, there's a, a small a small camera and a small mic, and. Um, the installation is that uh, you can see the screen, you can see the camera on the megaphone and the mic. So there's also a walkie-talkie uh -huh. and you can be the car itself. So you can stand from the screen, you can, you, you, you are the car. Uh -huh. And the car will drive around the, the square and you can actually talk to people. You have an interaction. But because... Ah! 
you're there and the car and the people are there, you can say things that you normally wouldn't say. It's a kind of a reaction on the, the chat generation we're into. Mm -hmm. When we chat, we can say, uh, for instance, if you're very shy, you can say, I love you yeah. and I, I want to be with you. Mm -hmm. But if you're here in person, I wouldn't say that maybe. Yeah. So, and that's the reason also I, uh, I built this, uh, this car. Uh -huh. And it that, speaks. I mean, it there speaks, is a voice. Yeah. It's your yeah. voice sometimes or my voice. Doesn't yeah. matter. Doesn't matter. It has not, nothing to do with uh, the idea that it, uh, it turns around and it gathers uh, sentimental feelings. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, indeed. And also, it, it, if, if, if you walk down the street, People are always into it themselves. Right? Mm. People are always busy with their own lives. I want to go to that place. And when I drive the car, everybody laughs and there's always a, a enjoyment and everybody's happy. And that's mm. also one of the reasons. The humor, humor is very important for me. I like to laugh yeah, and right. I like to enjoy. <laughs> Και μετά τις εκπλήξεις στη διαδρομή προς τα Τζιαρντίνη βρισκόμαστε στα εγγένεια του ελληνικού περιπτέρου. Πολύς ο κόσμος εκεί και μεγάλη αναμονή για να δούμε το έργο του σπουδαίου καλλιτέχνη Λουκά Σαμαρά, ενός σπαρακτικού δημιουργού που γεννήθηκε το 1936 στην Καστοριά, έφυγε πολύ μικρός για την Αμερική και έμεινε εκεί μόνιμα. Η τιμητική πρόσκληση που του έγινε από το Ελληνικό Υπουργείο Πολιτισμού να εκπροσωπήσει τη χώρα στην 53η Biennale της Βενετίας φαίνεται να λειτουργήσε επιμελητικά τουλάχιστον με τριοπαθός. Όλοι περιμέναμε μια πιο δυνατή εκπροσώπηση του έργου του και όχι μια σχετικά συμβατική παρουσίαση. Σε κάθε περίπτωση, ο Μάθιο Χίγκς, επιμελητής της έκθεσης κατ' επιλογή του ίδιου του καλλιτέχνη, και η Κατερίνα Κοσκινά που είχε επιμεληθεί την μεγάλη αναδρομική του στην Εθνική Πινακοθήκη το 2005, μιλούν. Ας ακούσουμε τον Μάθιο Χίξ να μιλά για την ιδέα που είχε γύρω από τη συγκεκριμένη έκθεση. How do you participate in this idea? I mean, how is an idea for curating to install like this? I think um, my relationship with Lucas goes back to when I was a teenager, when I first came across his work, when I started to get interested in art. So he's someone I feel like I've always had a relationship with, even though I didn't know him. But I think approaching the exhibition, Lucas's first exhibition was in 1959 as a young man. And this exhibition in Venice takes place 50 years later. And it seemed to me uh, an extraordinary opportunity to work with an artist who has been exhibiting for half a century. This seemed incredible in itself to me. So what I wanted to do was to think about Lucas's history, to think about his past, but to make sure that the exhibition didn't feel retrospective or historical. So the idea was how do you present an artist in the present tense but at the same time acknowledges history. So I introduced two pieces from the 1960s, almost like classical works by Lucas, a mirrored cube structure and a series of jeweled small sculptures, which are a kind of portrait of the artist in a way.
But also I introduced a very recent piece, which includes 24 of Lucas's peers, his friends such as the artist Jasper Johns or the artist Chuck Close, people he knew from the 1950s and 1960s. But really the exhibition is about the work Lucas has been making in the last five years. And I think one of the extraordinary things he's done is he only makes work with a computer now. So in his late 60s to his current age at 73, he's really introduced himself to a new technology. And this new technology, in a way, has produced this extraordinary creativity. And it reminded me of when he discovered Polaroid photography at the end of the 60s. All of a sudden, he made this technology his own. So for me, I was very interested in the idea that Lucas is both a historical figure, but at the same time, he's a very contemporary artist. And I think one of the exciting things so far has been the response of younger artists to this work, perhaps coming to Lucas Samaras for the first time. And for them, it's a revelation. But at the same time, people who are familiar with this work, I think are also seeing the work positioned in a way that perhaps they haven't before. And so, so these were some of my goals. And at the same time, I wanted to make an exhibition that um, in a way came out of the work. So I used the mirrored structure to set in motion a, a kind of symmetrical form of installation. And we see this symmetry a lot in the work itself. So the work informed the exhibition. Mm -hmm. And my job is to simply try and represent the artist's intentions. So we have the adventure of self, which is something that Lucas Samaras usually does. But which is the idea behind the photos that you have around? The strong thread in Lucas's work from the beginning is this relationship between his private world, so often it's inside the interior of his apartment, and then the world outside. And it's a, it seems to be, for Lucas, it's quite a complicated threshold. So in the photographs, he's taking photographs on his walks in New York City. He's not focusing on people, he's focusing on these abandoned chairs. And in the early 1970s, he made a very famous series of sculptures of chairs, and the chair, in a way, is a surrogate for the body. So the chairs that are abandoned on the street become a kind of people. And with the mirrored situation, the first thing I wanted the viewer to encounter was themselves. Mm -hmm. So immediately you're confronted with an image of yourself, but also you're confronted with an image of where you just came from, the gardens behind you. And I wanted to bring the outside inside the pavilion. And I think if people watch the video works in the show, this is something that Lucas is doing. He's always describing this relationship between the private world of his apartment and the public space of New York City. And we, we have two video projections in these small screens, although we have uh, the uh, internal and the external yeah. world. But what, this is very well understanding, but what about these persons? I mean, you told me before that they were friends or uh, people that he has a connection or a, a dialogue. Uh, which is the idea of uh, looking uh, left? I think that they are looking left. They're looking like something is happening outside. And, they are curious about it. Well, the 24 people are watching a video which is presented on the screen opposite them. So we as viewers can watch this film of Lucas undressing in his apartment, laying himself bare. So at the same time, Jasper Johns is watching the same situation. And in the 1970s, Lucas made a series of photographs called Sittings, where he invited people to his studio and asked them to be naked whilst he photographed them fully clothed. So in a way, he was asking people to create a kind of uncomfortable situation for themselves. 30 years later, he seems to have reversed this. And as an old man, he's laying himself bare for his peers, for his friends. But I think in a way that the work is arranged, they, they function like a kind of jury. They're judging the artist. And Lucas has talked about this before, but he said he's very interested to put the viewer in the position of the artist where you're being judged, you're being observed, you're being considered, you're being watched. So I think in a way he's setting up a, an interesting relationship because we stand between Lucas and the viewers and we become another layer of the audience. And I think this is interesting because it's, Lucas is known for being quite a reclusive individual, yet he constantly appears in his work. So he's a person we all have a very clear idea of what he looks like, who he is, yet at the same time, we know him as a reclusive person. And this seems to be a paradox to me, that if you really were reclusive, you wouldn't present yourself to the world. So I think he uses his art as a way to negotiate this space between himself and an audience and the public.
do you think that his work, what we see here in Venice, uh, shows in a way the, this dimension of his life? I mean, somebody who left his country when he was very, very young, and his relation with the, the environment that he went was very, very different from his country. Do you think that this connection between the self and the outside space is connected with this uh, situation of being so many years? Well, I'm, you know, I'm not a psychologist, but I think... Yeah, I know this is a, a but question I, very close to psychology, <laughs> but... But I think, Luke, I think Lucas left Greece at a very interesting time as a teenager. Mm -hmm. So just as he was starting to develop an identity for himself as a young man, mm -hmm. He was taken from the place he grew up in and arrived in America. And I can only imagine that was a huge cultural transition, especially at that time. And in some respects, it makes me think that, you know, perhaps Lucas was never a comfortable American, but whilst he was in America, he was never comfortably Greek. So he found himself in a limbo. And I think in a way, that status exists and persists in the work because I wouldn't describe Lucas as a fully American artist, but nor would I describe him as a fully Greek artist. And I think he sits in a very unusual position because nowadays we're so familiar with artists moving around the world, displacing themselves, changing countries, changing identities. But I think at this time it would have been an unusual situation. And I think in a way it gave Lucas an extreme luxury that he could have both identities as and when he chose. And then you see this especially in a lot of the earlier work where he's adopting identities. Mm -hmm. He's starting to create kind of characters around himself. Mm -hmm. And then you see this influence in, say, the work of Cindy Sherman. Mm -hmm. And I think yes. it comes from this experience. My guess is that as a teenager, just when you're beginning to get an idea of yourself, he found himself somewhere completely different. And so that, I think, he exists in an unusual place. And of course, I would imagine there are many artists of a diaspora after the Second World War emigres of one kind or another who found themselves in the United States mm -hmm. but never became American, mm -hmm. even if they stayed there their whole life.